Okay, let's move on to chapter 12, Sexual Development Throughout Life. It's a kind of a long chapter, so there will be several um, clips that go along with this chapter. Let's start with Freud's psychosexual development. I had shown you guys this chart before in the section on sexual orientation, so now we're actually going to look at the different stages of development. So. I assume everybody's heard of Freud. I've yet to meet anybody in my face-to-face -face classes who says, Freud? Freud who? Everybody's at least heard of him, right? Um, one of the things he's the most famous for is for developing these stages of development. And um, his stages have provided um, jumping off points for a lot of other theorists and have also provided fodder for theorists to try to refute because not everybody agrees with these psychosexual stages. Um, one of the things that Freud was just the master of is sort of irritating people. <laughs> so the fact that he called them psychosexual stages was one of those things that in the late 1800s and early 1900s, um, you know, people were titillated by it slash also, you know, horrified that he was talking like this. Um, what he's suggesting is that your psychic energy your what he calls libido and your thanatos get focused on different parts of your body as you mature from birth through puberty and that these different stages where your libido is attached to different parts of your body produce crises struggles that need to be resolved so for example in the oral stage between birth and about a year year and a half the libido is focused on the mouth, the tongue, the lips, biting, sucking, chewing, things like that. One of the big major things that's going to happen to us during this stage is that we get weaned, either off the breast or off of a bottle. And according to Freud, this is a pretty traumatic, traumatic transition that we all have gone through, where we were told we no longer can obtain our nourishment from the breast and he thought you know back in the day that he was writing you know breast was the issue but of course bottles have um, become fairly common and so um, a lot of neo Freudians new Freudians have said well the bottles also traumatic having to go from sucking to get your nutrition to having to bite and chew and stuff like that that's a transition and it's and it's it causes a crisis the timing of weaning is really important according to Freud. If you were weaned too early or if you were weaned too late, you can get fixated at the oral stage and we can tell that you were fixated in the oral stage when you're an adult, you'll be, let's say, smoking, you know, doing things with your mouth, overeating, talking a lot, chewing gum, always drinking from a water bottle, things like that. So if you were either weaned too early or too late, we'll see the same basic kinds of behaviors. The next stage of development he called the anal stage and he said this would be between weaning and about age three. The focus of the libido is the, this chart says anus, but it's really the bowel and the bladder. Um, because the major developmental milestone that's going on here is the child's getting potty trained. This again is thought to be traumatic, you know, having to go from just letting it flow wherever it comes out to having to actually hold it and then release it in the proper place and you know if you fail it's called an accident and everybody has to change cl your clothes and it's all very degrading and embarrassing and stuff like that and so um, depending on whether you were too rigidly potty trained or ri potty trained with too much laxness can determine what kind of fixation you'll have if your parents potty trained you too early, closer to one, um, you may be obsessed with orderliness and you can develop what's called an anal retentive personality type. If you were potty trained too late, if you were well past age three, then you could develop anal expulsive personality type. So you're prone to messiness and disorder and you're very lackadaisical. Um, the next stage we already visited in the chapter on sexual orientation, between ages three and six, 
the focus of the libido is on the genitals, but not in a pleasurable sort of way. That's going to be safe for after puberty. What he's talking about during this stage is that three to six year olds look down at their genitals and if there's a penis present they think yay I'm one of the chosen ones if there is no penis then they think oh no what did I do that caused somebody to cut off my penis so uh, the big challenge in this stage is gender identity really and so um, according to Freud once children recognize what that they have a penis or not they become attracted to their opposite sex parent and try to eliminate their same sex parent. So for little boys they're going to want to murder their dads so they can have their moms to themselves and for little girls they're going to want to murder their moms so they can have their dads to themselves. He called those the Oedipus complex or the electric complex depending on the sex of the child. And like I mentioned he thought um, not having a, an a same-sex parent to identify with would interfere with your gender identity development if you um, didn't have to resolve the this conflict if you could let's say that you are male and you're being raised by a mom you might identify with her and ultimately end up either gay or never fully repress the lust that you feel for your mom so either way he called that deviant he also thought a lot of sexual dysfunction stems from this stage, and we'll talk about that more when we get to the chapter on sexual dysfunction. The latent phase, a lot of people see the word latent and assume it means nothing's happening or there, you know, there's no developmental challenge going on here. But um, between ages six and about puberty, he said that there, the, the thing that makes it latent is that the, lib the libido is not attached to any specific body part. Instead, it's focused outwardly. So between 6 and 12, kids are really interested in developing platonic friends and doing well in school and things like that. So the libido is really focused outward. Um, the major development during the stage is that you start to use your defense mechanisms so that you can protect your ego from the truth about yourself. Um, so you start to develop things like repression or regression and other things like that. Um, in this chart, it says that you can't be fixated at the stage as an adult and that's what Freud said but some of the neo-Freudians have said if you get fixated at this stage you might become a workaholic right you're too devoted to your work or you may have like a lot of platonic friends and never have a romantic relationship because the hallmark of adulthood according to this model is having um, romantic relationships um, once you reach puberty you enter the genital stage and so now the focus of the of the libido is on the pleasure associated with the genitals and the function of the genitals making children so he said when you reach full sexual maturity um, your focus becomes finding a romantic partner and then reproducing if everything went perfectly in your uh, upbringing and all your needs were met appropriately at the different stages coming up to gen to the genital stage you'll have all of your libido with you and you'll be able to cope with all the varied demands of a healthy adult. But it's hard to imagine that parents can adequately meet the needs when it's so easy to over or underindulge a child at any given stage. Um, so Fred thinks most of us probably have at least one fixation um, and it can be you know discerned through uh, you know our behaviors and then also when we're under stress we'll regress back to a stage where we've left some of our energy and so if you're under stress let's say let's say you got in a car accident just a little fen fender bender no big deal uh, but you know you need to call it in and um, report the accident if the first thing you think is to call your parent that would be Freud would say that that would be evidence that you're actually still a little fixated at the oral stage because you're displaying dependency which is a hallmark of the of the oral stage um, if you just cannot bear having your books out of order on the bookshelf or if you're all if you're always on time a little bit early for meetings um, for I would say that you're anal retentive if you're always a little tardy or a little you know you don't control yourself super well you know if it feels good you do it he'd say that you're um, anal expulsive so we can see behaviors in adulthood that might be evidence of fixation at earlier stages 
All right, enough on Freud, though. Um, let's talk about some other things. Uh, between birth and two years is called the infant period. And Kinsey had done, you know, a bunch of surveys of um, different sources and found lots of different accounts of sexual behavior among infants. It sounds a little creepy, right, to think of babies having any kind of any kind of behavior that would indicate sexual impulses. But anybody out there who's had a puppy realizes that, you know, yeah, there's some evidence of sexual behavior among puppies. You know, why would a why would a human necessarily be different, right? Um, so what people reported, parents, doctors reported, was that baby boys display erections, that baby girls seem to experience vaginal lubrication, that they engage in self-stimulation of the genitals. This is the first place where we're going to see differences in self-stimulation rates, right? Because about five to six months, they start to see it among boys, and it's more like 10 to 11 months in girls. Um, probably a function of the fact that male genitalia is more accessible and uh, therefore more stimulatable, so boys figure it out faster. There's even evidence of infant orgasm where, for example, one mom took her baby to the doctor and said, I think the baby's having seizures. You know, I put the baby down on its stomach to take a nap, and uh, she starts, she kind of gets up a little bit on her knees and starts rocking, and then she kind of gets to a fever pitch of, pitch of pelvic rocking, and then all of a sudden she like has a seizure, and then she falls asleep. And of course, the doctor was like, mm, kind of sounds like she might have had an orgasm. The mom's like, oh, my baby? But it's, you know, a normal function of, you know, stimulation and stuff. So it's, um, you know, probably not that surprising, but adults are always a little surprised. It turns out that babies who engage in genital play, like stick their hand down their diaper every time they get an opportunity or, you know, when they're in the bathtub, they, you know, play with their genitals and stuff like that. It's actually a good sign of a healthy relationship with the mom. Um, babies who feel comfortable with their moms are more likely to engage in genital play than babies who feel insecure. So it's actually a sign of health and moms maybe need to not be super um, concerned. And I thought it was really important to tell you the year that they first discovered this because this is reasonably old data, right? This is something that um, has been known for a really long time, that babies who are comfortable um, and feel secure are more likely to engage in um, self-stimulating behaviors. Now, there are some criticisms of Kinsey's reports, and I kind of mentioned that a little bit earlier when we were talking about Kinsey before. Um, this is a the cover of a book by Judith Reisman called Crimes and Consequences, where she basically is accusing Kinsey of knowing about children's sexual responses because he was a pedophile. Um, but his actual sources were college students recollecting things from their childhood. Now, nobody remembers stuff from between zero and two very accurately, so we're not going to rely on this from that, that age. But for older behaviors, college students can look back on their childhood and report stuff. Um, mothers reported about their own children and what they saw their children doing. Sometimes looking for a little reassurance from the survey taker that some of the stuff was okay. Um, and then he did interview pedophiles. And one semi-valid com uh, complaint is that he didn't report these pedophiles to the authorities. It's not like some of them were in prison and he interviewed them in prison. Um, but some of them were not in prison. They were self-reported pedophiles that he, were willing to talk to him as long as he didn't report them. And um, today our, uh, our human ethics requires that if somebody reports a crime, we're supposed, to, we're supposed to report them. So that is one legitimate complaint, is that he didn't report these pedophiles. Um, but there's no evidence in anything. His students, nobody ever said that he actually engaged in any kind of activity with, with children. Um, there's, if you Google this issue, you'll find a woman who claims that Kinsey paid her father to molest her so that her father could report on her sexual re response. Um, there's no evidence anywhere except for her claim that um, supports what she's saying. So, um, you know, some people just don't trust him because of what he was studying. Uh, some don't like the way he looks. Uh, there, some of you may have seen the movie Kinsey, and some of it's based on fiction, just like all movies are. So I didn't know the man. I don't know, but there's no evidence. There's no document, documentable evidence that he engaged in any of the stuff he's accused of. Um, 
let's see what else I was going to say. Okay, yeah, let's go ahead and uh, take a little break. We'll come back and we'll pick up with childhood, which is a pretty long span, three years to puberty. <laughs> 